In this programme, we're going to try and draw together the various developments and schools of modern Western philosophy into a single coherent picture. We're going to take three paces back, as it were, and try and see the whole in some perspective. This means looking at modern Western philosophy in the context of modern Western society. And it also means looking at it in the context of its own past, trying to see just why and how the central concerns developed as they did, and in consequence of that, what the outstanding features of our present position are. And perhaps on the basis of that, a few informal guesses about what developments are likely to be in the immediate future. When philosophers use the term modern philosophy, they mean philosophy since Descartes, who flourished in the early 17th century. The development of philosophy since then has been one continuous, if complex, tradition, so that the philosophy of our own day has to be looked at against that background. For some hundreds of years before Descartes, on the other hand, the situation had been entirely different. There had been one single worldview based on Christianity and enforced by the political authorities, so that any public questioning of it was forbidden and usually punished by death. By comparison with today, people's knowledge was almost static, or at least very slow changing, and held with great certainty, being based on no less an authority than God or his church on earth. It's only after the Renaissance and the Reformation that you get the spectacular emergence and growth of the new science, which produced, among other things, a new philosophy. The old certainties are undermined, and with them topple the old authorities. So the problem was raised in a new and acute form. How can our claims to knowledge be validated? It's a problem which is still unsolved. For a long time, people thought that science was the provider of absolute certainty. But now we know that this is not so. Well, to discuss contemporary philosophy against this historical and social background, I've invited Ernest Gellner, who is both a professional philosopher and a professional sociologist. In fact, his official title is Professor of Philosophy with Special Reference to Sociology at the London School of Economics. Professor Gellner, it seems to me self-evident that modern philosophy, contemporary philosophy, 20th century philosophy, can only really be understood against the background of some such historical and social perspective as I very lightly sketched in in that introduction just now. But it also seems to me self-evident that most of your colleagues as professional philosophers are sort of blind to this historical and social dimension. Would you agree with that? Yes, I, I very strongly agree with your main, your two main points. I may have reservations about some, some, some of your side remarks, but your two central points um, seem to me entirely correct. Now, the, the, the main point I'll rephrase as follows. What you defined as modern philosophy, Descartes onwards, 17th century onwards, is basically, though not always consciously, a kind of commentary on the social and intellectual change which has taken place since then. And it, it can only be correctly understood in, in, in the light of this, this, this kind of observation. And your second, minor, your second point you associated with it also seems to me correct. Not enough people are, are clearly enough aware of this. One, one thing that looking at it in that way brings to the fore is why it is that the central problem of modern philosophy ever since Descartes has been the problem of knowledge, this basic question of, of what do we know, or indeed, do we really know in the sense of being absolutely certain of anything, and if so, how do we know that we know? This has all the way through been the central question, hasn't it? Well, this is central. I think if, if one had to define modern philosophy, if one had to define it with one feature only, or one tray only, I think this is the one one would pick out, or at least I would pick out, namely that it gets absolutely obsessed with the problem of knowledge. If you give me two features, I'll add, in, add another one, and I'll do it in due course. But if you allow me one, the centrality of knowledge to thought. Uh, one could sum this up as follows. That prior to this period, knowledge is one thing amongst others. It's an important thing, but it's, it's a thing. There are other, there are other problems. Knowledge is an event in the world, an important one, but it is one amongst others. What characterizes thought of this period is that it tends to get the other way around. The world becomes an event in knowledge. It's kind of inversion. Knowledge becomes absolutely pivotal. And this is, of course, very, very much connected with your opening point, the distinctive features of the modern world in, in which the philosophy operates. And do you also agree with me that this arises from the breakdown of the old authority? 
that men yes. are no longer... They, at one time, they knew what they knew because God said so, or the Bible said so, or the church said so. Once that's undermined, then the question arises, well, what authority do we have for what we believe? Yes, I do agree, but I, th I would be inclined to expand it and, and not necessarily concentrate on the monotheistic or wh whatever the other premises were of, of the preceding order. What was really characteristic of the preceding order was fairly stable and that, so to speak, society could feed back its own ideas to itself in confidence against a stable background. Well, the stability is gone. Um, the, this is probably the only society to live with sustained cognitive growth. I mean, nowadays people are preoccupied with economic growth, but economic growth is intimately connected with the fact that, that knowledge is growing. Um, and this is very, very disturbing. This, and this has a number of features. You mentioned one the growth of knowledge, but then there, there, there are various other features which, which are connected with it, and it's absolutely unique. Well, now, you say there are other features connected with it. Let, let's start talking about what some of them are. Well, I, I'd say, I'd list three or four. The, the phenomenal growth of knowledge in, in one particular area. The second feature is not exactly a contraction of knowledge in other areas, but a relative contraction. That's the people, um, in, by comparison with the success story, in what is roughly speaking natural science, they're the failure story in other fields, whereas people previously were confident, they're, they're now less confident. This, this is tied up with a number of features like, like the breakdown of a central authority. The, 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 You're the, referring, I take it, to ethics and religious yes, belief, are you, yes, and things of that kind, yes. that, that, that men used to be sure of their ethical beliefs and moral beliefs and thought they had authority for these. Yeah. Now they're no longer sure or even indeed know what to believe. Now they're no, no longer sure um, in, about their ethical, social and various other, various other beliefs. And the sheer contrast of this with a kind of glorious success in the field of natural science. Um, it's not, natural science is not only unstable, but it's, so to speak, successfully unstable. There's a fair amount of consensus about the way, although there's instability, that the next thing is better than the last one. By and large, and nobody knows quite how it works, by and large it works, and it works for the better. Within other fields, this is by no means so. So in other words, what you're saying is that before Descartes, yeah. people didn't know much, but yeah. by comparison with present attitudes, they were very sure of what they did They know. were sure of what they thought they knew, whether in fact they knew it or not. <laughs> yes. and, and then you get this runaway growth of science the, and scientific kinds of knowledge. The map of knowledge gets distorted because some areas are obviously growing and other areas are either not growing at all or growing very slowly or actually contracting, or what there is gets kind of corroded by doubt. So this, these are the two features, the, the, the expansion in one direction and the absolute or relative contraction in other areas. Uh, connected with that, the, the, the third feature, once, once you have this, um, if you like, instability or disproportion between these areas, you can't use the one area to sustain the other. Um, if you have, I mean, not, the, the, the successful kind of knowledge gets specialized. Uh, it can't, it's, it's known to be unstable, it's highly authoritative in a curious kind of way in that, that it's, it's, it's respected, though it's not definitive. And at the same time, it's a very specialized idiom, the specialization of like natural scientific knowledge. It's not, no longer in the same idiom in which we normally speak when we speak about human beings, mm -hmm. makes it un, unavailable as a premise for one's vision of one's social life. So if you like, the, the third feature would be the specialization of what could loosely be called positive knowledge. Yes. It seems to me, I don't know whether you would agree with this or not, it seems to me that for a long time after uh, confidence in the old theistic uh, premises of knowledge was undermined, what people were looking for, possibly unconsciously, was a substitute for that. They were looking for some other single category in terms of which everything could ultimately be explained. Yes. And for a couple of hundred years or so in the West, it was science. People believed that in the end, everything would be explicable in terms of science. Or then, growing up alongside that, you get the Hegelian kind of philosophy in which the supreme category becomes history. Everything is ultimately explicable in terms of history. Or then you get, say, Marxism, which comes along and tries to combine the two and produce a kind of schema which combines historical explanation and scientific explanation as the forms in which everything is ultimately to be explained. And indeed claim that historical knowledge is, 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 is the version of scientific knowledge, yes. I, I, I'd accept the picture. I think I, think I would characterize it somewhat differently from you. Yes. Um, How but, would you characterize it? Well, um, the, the, the two, we mentioned one, uh, well, the, the two main trends, reaction to this, to this breakup, are the following. On the one hand, a concentration on the problem of knowledge. It isn't so much 
that science is the, is, the, is, the, is the substitute for the previous certainty. It's the method in which it is obtained. The, if, if, the world, if the world is, if, the, if one's vision of the world is no longer stable, at least the way in which one finds out about it could be stable. This is one of the main themes of modern philosophy in the sense in which you def define it, the pre preoccupation with the theory of knowledge as a provider of a kind of touchstone for what is good knowledge and what isn't. Looking in upon one's tools, if the world isn't stable, let at least the tools by which we find out about it be, be, be the stable premise. And this is one sustained continual theme, the attempt to use the theory of knowledge, the examination of our own cognitive apparatus, of our own, the, the workings of our minds, or the criteria by which we, we, we're separating, that's one persistent theme, and I think a very good one, and, 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 and it, it, it can only properly be understood against the background which, which you and I have sketched out, I think. The other theme, which is exemplified by Marx, which you've already mentioned, is to have a new kind of metaphysic which is, which is not really an account of some kind of transcendent reality, but what, what could be called a human social metaphysic, a specification of the general features of either the human or the social or historic situation. And these, I think, these two strands really cover most of, most, most of what has happened in the past 300 years, and their intertwining is really the story of modern thought. Now, you've mentioned uh, one, and I've mentioned one, one of the important strands, Marxism. Uh, I'm going to want to ask you about all of them in turn, but since this has cropped up, let me ask you about this now. How successful do you think Marxism has been in its attempt to cope with these basic problems? Well, basically, basically it hasn't. Um, it, it's, uh, I mean, it, it gets top marks by precisely trying to look at the, at the um, social context of our predicament, but in, in, in various ways, it, it, it fails. I mean, some, some, um, it, 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 it doesn't, it, it, get good, 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 it get good, gets top marks for asking the right kind of question or some of the right kind of questions, but basically it's mistaken. It's as simple as that. Can you give examples of, of which of its questions are right and why, which, why some of the answers are mistaken? Well, this is, <coughs> this is, a, this, this is a bit big topic. I think the, the, the right question is to look at the, at the preconditions of the emergence of the modern world. Um, but the wrong answers, well, um, the ones I'd pick out, the, 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 the elements of error which seem to be crucial, is first of all a, a utopian and messianic expectation. The idea that some kind of total fulfillment is available when, when certain dis defects and disadvantages in the present, present social order are removed. There'll be kind of automatic self-adjusting system in which the problem will no longer arise, and that un until one has, has this, something's radically wrong. Now this is, this is the kind of general utopianism or general messianism, which people often trace back to the religious sources or to the absolute idealism of the German romanticism which immediately preceded it and which influenced Karl Marx. More specifically, um, I should have thought there were the, 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 the errors about the nature of politics, which are absolutely central, the idea that politics in the sense of coercion and the management of people is simply the byproduct of a certain kind of class, of, of, a, of a class structure. And once that goes, it will not be necessary. Um, deprives anyone who believes in that theory from asking the right question, which is, on the contrary, given that the management of people by people and the management, the, 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 the control by the polity of the economy is with us and rightly with us, what kind of polity shall we have which, um, which will both deliver the economic goods and prevent tyranny? Um, in, they, they, in fact, Marxism does lead people to ask the wrong, wrong question on, 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 on their score. I'd like to take up with you another philosophy which uh, we are now in a position to see in its context uh, in this discussion, and that is relativism. Uh, it's very fashionable in the modern world for people to believe and to say, well, um, any opinion is as good as any other opinion. There is no ultimate truth. Uh, therefore, um, you can almost, as it were, shop among philosophies to buy the one that suits you best. Um, and it's clear to see how this arose in the context that we were discussing earlier. Namely, you get a breakdown of traditional authorities. People no longer know where to look for the validation of their beliefs. And they come in the end sometimes to think, well, 
beliefs can't be validated, they're all equally valid or equally invalid. What is your view of, of, of relativism uh, in modern thought? Well, relativism simply isn't an available option at all. Um, leaving aside the abstract question of whether it's true in itself, as a recipe for coping with this breakdown of authority, with the, the, the general problem situation which we sketched, it could only work if there were sort of island communities, each of them with their own vision within which you, within which you could live. I mean, the, 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 the worst situation in the world history, which was not satisfying those conditions perfectly, uh, satisfied them in some measure. Um, they the, the, the celebrated story about the man who asked the Delphic Oracle as to what rights he should observe. And the reply was, in each city, observe the rights of their city. That's all right, all right. In, so in, in, in ancient Greece prior to Alexander. There were identifiable cities, and a man who was told to observe the rights of of the city he was inhabiting could, could in fact do so, the, or the city he was, he was visiting, as the case may be. If, on the other hand, there are no well-defined isolable communities, if, in fact, the terms of reference are what we sketched out, namely rapid change, an over a kind of global world with overlapping sub-communities in disagreement, when you tell a man to do in Rome as Romans would, he doesn't know what, what you're telling him to do because there's no unambiguously marked unit called Rome or, any, in fact, any other city. Uh, relative is not an option for this kind of reason. But a relativist might say to you, well, if you're going to deny my attachment to relativism, you've got to show me some way in which I can validate one belief as against other beliefs. Well, I think the main, the main tradition of modern philosophy hasn't been a failure uh, precisely in this, in this respect. Um, you think what, it's a success story? By and large, um, yes, yes I do. I think that the theory of knowledge, which attempts to codify the criteria of valid knowledge, um, it's, not, it's not a complete success story. I can't refer you to a book which, which, which finally settled this. Has on the whole, may not, not, on the whole been fairly successful, yes. Yes, I do, yes. What I would like to add, incidentally, um, we're in, in a way doing this back to front by discussing the solution without the problem, um, we specified some of the features of our problem situation, the growth of knowledge in some areas, the contraction in others, the separation of descriptive knowledge from the idiom of daily life and daily situation. I think there's one, there's one further feature which we haven't mentioned which seems to be terribly important. And this might be called the kind of the, the dehumanization price of the advance of knowledge. Um, I think this is important Will for you the... go into what you mean by that? Yes. Well, the point of the, point, the story of, of the advance of knowledge seems to me this, that knowledge proceeds... One, one, one of the secrets of knowledge is the subsumption of events, phenomena, including behavior, including human, human behavior, under generalizations, under generalizations can be formulated in neutral language, repeatable by other people. Well, the price of this is that it seems to dehumanize the phenomena which I described. If, you are, if your behavior, your attitudes or whatever, are explained in terms in the kind of interplay of entities which are specified in kind of neutral language, it kind of destroys your individuality. Incidentally, to take the most, most septic aspect of this, it also dis possibly destroys your illusion of freedom, if it is an illusion. Now, this kind of dehumanization effect, or what sociologists sometimes call, the, the, under the influence of Max Weber, the disenchantment of the world, the subsumption of human events under non-human abstract categories, is very, very disturbing. And if I were to single out the second main feature in modern philosophy, it being the kind of movement for the preservation of man, the kind of retention of the human image of man as the defense against being explained by science, whether or not that science is particularly successful. And, and this, 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 is, this, is the, this, this is what I meant when I mentioned dehumanization. And this is the kind of the twin theme, the second theme of, of, um, of modern philosophy. The one theme is preoccupation with knowledge and the kind of ultimate touchstone is a substitute source of certainty. The delimitation of knowledge serves to provide us a basis. The other is a provision of arguments for the retention of our kind of human image of it. I think in sorting out, in separating these two main themes of, of modern philosophy, uh, the study of what constitutes knowledge and the attempt to 
find a theoretical basis for the preservation of our own humanity. I think you've done something very illuminating there, but for the sake of clarity, I want to keep them separate in this discussion. And I'd like to pursue the, the line of, of the theory of knowledge a little more before I come on to the, as it were, the social philosophy. Because yeah. there seem to me to be one or two or three extremely interesting and important aspects of this development that we still haven't touched on. Uh, you've referred to the instability of modern knowledge, and I think this is an extremely important thing. I mean, the fact that modern knowledge is growing so sensationally fast all the time yes. means that, so to speak, the premises of our outlook are unstable, that they never remain the same for two decades together, so that you can never build up a coherent and stable world outlook, so that we're moving all the time from one world outlook to another, uh, with, with, with a sense of the ground permanently shifting beneath our feet. Well, um, th this is so. Um, I mean, so some, some of the philosophers of knowledge which, which are available try to incorporate this feature and say not, it's not a problem, it's a solution, this is how it should be. I mean, in different kinds of ways, philosophers such as um, Sir Karl Popper, the American logician Quine, incorporate precisely the stress on instability as part of their theory of knowledge. Now, I think to some extent this can be overdone, uh, this comes back to our opening point about the distinct, distinctiveness of our situation. The way, it, the way instability can be overdone is if, if one considers it a permanent feature, not only of the human condition in, in, as such, but the condition of life. If you try to anchor the, the fact of growth, the fact of cognitive growth, to some kind of permanent story going back right into biological history. Now, I think this is wrong. I, um, it's a kind of solution which I happen to disagree with. It's a, a solution which tries to re-establish security on the basis of a cosmic story, the kind of overall development from the amoeba onwards of growth by, tr by trial and error experimentation and so on, which on the whole replaces the deity as a kind of guarantor that the thing will be, have a happy end. Now, I don't think this will do for, for, for a variety of reasons. I think one has to as well... The, the, the premises have to have to have to have something to do with this rather distinctive situation um, since the 17th century or so. The specification of what is distinctive of rapid cognitive growth, um, as opposed to the relative stability, which is which which was the normal human condition before that. Another point I want to take up with you is this: that before Descartes, the subject matter of philosophy was, so to speak, supernatural. Man's relationship with God was, so to speak, the, the matter of ultimate concern. After Descartes, you get the switch of focus to human activities, to man's politics, uh, social life, psychology, cultural life, and so on. And an enormous increase, not only in the scientific or quasi-scientific study of these things, but in the involvement of philosophy with the study of these things. Would you go along with that? I would go along with that. The, the way you formulate it seems to be open to some objection. You, 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 you keep talking about philosophy and science as if these had been separate at that time. Now, in, in fact, they didn't really get sharply separated till some point in the, in, 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 in the 18th century. And the expression natural philosophy meant physics. And this is still enshrined in... in, in, in uh, things like titles of professors of physics in Scottish universities, as a professor of natural philosophy. So the, the, separ the separation came fairly late. And the separation is, far, is, is partly a reflection of what we are talking about, namely the separation of substantive inquiry from the inquiry in, in, into methods of knowing. Um, but by and large, your basic point I accept entirely. Yeah. Now that you've made, I think, these very illuminating, broad generalizations about the development of philosophy since Descartes, I'd like us to look at some of the specific contemporary schools against that background. I've already asked you uh, to do this in the case of Marxism and relativism, but what about some of the others? What, for example, about existentialism? How do you see that as fitting into this picture? Well, it, existentialism <laughs> does fit into this picture. Um, existential is a curious kind of philosophy in that, like the Cartesian tradition, it is very in individualistic. But unlike it, it's not really preoccupied with, um, it's not centrally preoccupied with the problem of knowledge. Characteristically, it's not all that interested in natural science at all. It's basically preoccupied with the human situation. Well, that brings us really to the second of your two main themes, Indeed, doesn't yeah. it? And perhaps we ought to take that up now, and if you like, develop uh, uh, your characterization of existentialism against the background of this second yes. tradition. 
Well, the ironic fact about existentialism is, well, the number of ironic facts, one, <laughs> one of them is it just, it just, it, it, it's preoccupied with the human situation. It claims by implication to be an, be an account of the human situation as such anywhere. But in fact, the irony is it's, it's distinctively an account of the human situation in the post-Cartesian or post, even particularly post 18th century world. It descri it's, it's concentrates on the individual who has to take responsibility for his general worldview and his moral commitment, and who cannot pass a buck. Now, of course, it seems to me characteristic of the human situation in most societies, the societies with stable belief systems, is precisely that he doesn't have to pass a buck. He, the, 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 the authority is confident, and unless he's actively a rebel, he can fall back on it. So existentialism, whilst claiming to be a general account of human situation, is in fact an account of a very distinctive Kind of, kind of, kind of. But still, as far as it goes, it is, in the terms you've just outlined, an account of our As situation. far as it goes, it's, it's obviously, it's, it's, and, and, and its, and its uh, popularity, when it was popular, either reflection of this, it has, has, has interesting things to say about it. I mean, of course, one of the interesting, one of the significant things about it is highly fashionable in periods of acute crises and intellectual depression. I mean, highly fashionable in Germany after the First War, in France after the Second. Um, with the with, 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 with the coming of affluence, it, it um, and, and of course the, the kind of relative, at least relative consensus, the so-called end of ideology period, it became less fashionable. But this, yes, this is this is one of the things to be said about it. Another, th there are other things to be well. It has a certain defect as a as the university subject. There's something slightly comic and bizarre about turning the human condition into a learned profession. I mean, the human condition is something you either, you know, we all, we all know we about. All, we're in it. We are yes. already, and we don't actually yeah. have to read extremely difficult, rather protracted books, you know, to find about it. This is, this is a slight comic about it. And it leads to, leads to one of its features. It, it, um, it tends sometimes to be said in extremely potentious language, which is, I suppose, part of its Hegelian heritage. Another feature of it, which is very conspicuous in, in a thinker like Sartre, um, existential in the kind of a priori psychology. And so it tells us about how you feel and how you think, not by asking you or observing you, but by deducing it from certain general features of your situation. So the fact that you're going to die, the fact that you have to make moral decisions without having them guaranteed. It's these kind of, the fact that you, that other people are objects to you, but you're an object to the other people. There are these very general features about, about the limitation of one's existence, one's, one's infuriating and interdependence with other people, and the fact that one has to make decisions on inadequate evidence. These are the kind of premises. From that, it deduces how you really feel. But well, it does, in fact, say interesting things about it. But one of the objections against it is that it's quite useful, actually, to find out how people really feel. And people don't necessarily feel how they ought to feel um, on, on their theory. And in, in the case of a very interesting thinker like Sartre, who tries then to combine it, when he tries to marry, as he admittedly, as he confessedly does, marry existentialism and Marxism, um, the a priorism of his existentialism and the concrete empirical context of his observation about society don't, don't, don't mix at all easily. These are the things I would say about it, yes. Are there any developments elsewhere in modern philosophy outside existentialism uh, which seem to you to be particularly promising and interesting along the lines of this strand of, of um, uh, philosophizing for the preservation of our humanity, which you mentioned earlier? Well, I'm, I don't... I don't think we can expect it so, to preserve too much of our humanity too easily. I mean, I think this is this is one one of the main themes is people who offer recipes or kind of almost carte blanche kind of um, uh, formulae for saying that we we really are the way we think we are and we we need we needn't feel threatened. I think we do need to feel threatened. It's, it's just it is it is a price. Um, the more we can explain the world, the more we are ourselves explained. And you can't have one without the other. Um, no, no, in this, in, this kind of, um, in this kind of sphere, I'm, I'm not terribly sympathetic to the, to the Society for the Preservation of Humanity. I think we should preserve humanity, but not too much, and not, above all, not too cheaply. I mean, my model in this sphere is, is, uh, is a quite an old-fashioned philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who was very, very concerned with preserving the minimum of humanity, namely free will, moral responsibility, autonomous cognition of the kind of premises, but, that, but no more than was necessary and not cheaply, only, only the absolute minimum kind of baggage. And for the rest, accepted that the price of 
the price of the advancement of knowledge is that we also become objects of knowledge. Well, now, how, do, how in the context of, of this uh, background do you see the uh, schools of philosophy in which you and I uh, have, in fact, uh, grown up and learned and developed and taught uh, Anglo-Saxon philosophy in this century? Well, um, I mean, I suppose um, the, the, the most influential philosophy in the period in which you and I were involved in it as, as both the students and teachers of it was presumably so-called linguistic philosophy or the philosophy whose main single source is, um, is, is the later work of Ludwig Wittgenstein. And of course, I'm highly critical of this, as, 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 as you know. In order to discuss it, I have to violate the, 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 the rule you imposed on me of separating the tradition, the theory of knowledge tradition, from the well, preservation uh, of humanity. Feel free to break that because, down. Well, yeah. he, he, as many other thinkers, of course, are astride, astride this philosophy. Now, he started from the position which was a slightly eccentric variant of the theory of knowledge tradition. He started from the enterprise of, of delimiting not so much what could be known, but what could be, what could be thought or what could be said, the limits of meaning. Now, I didn't, this was, a, this was, a, this was an innovation highly characteristic of the century, that instead of circumscribing what could be known and codifying the rules of knowledge, one instead one codified what could be meant, what was there to be said. Now, it's a very convenient kind of device, as in the case of circumscribing what can be known, if there's only a limited area that can be known or that can be said or meant, that provides you with the premises. If, and this is a kind of substitute for the old stability. And I suppose there were various reasons why people acquired this kind of language or meaning sophistication. One of them was, were simply technical advances in, 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 um, in formal mathematical logic, where certain expressions which looked as if they had meaning had to be excluded or attempts were made to exclude them. So people hit, hit on the idea that what, what is available for you and I to say to each other and to mean is circumscribed and is circumscribed more narrowly than our intuitions give us. And if this could be circumscribed very, very narrowly, this would provide a kind of nice basis. Well, this was the, 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 the early philosophy of Wittgenstein and Anderson of Bertrand Russell had a strong element of this, of using the limitations of what could be said as a kind of, as, 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 as a kind of basis um, for re-establishing a, a safe picture. Now, he reacted against this um, by kind of, um, kind of overreaction, saying this was an error. The, 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 the real essence of language is not that it is a cover for a limited number of things. The real essence of language is that, that you and I use it in, in a for a wide variety of purposes, in a wide variety of social contexts, and it is all right. Once we realize this, the, the problem disappears, and the one error is to seek some kind of external, ex external, external validator, which in his youth he had thought in, 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 in unmasking the secrets of notation or the secrets of language. Now, I think he was totally mistaken in this, um, well, in, the, in, in his later philosophy, you mean? In his later philosophy, you indeed. Think that's mistaken. Well, yes. it's mistaken for the reasons which we outline that the, the term of reference which stimulated the modern pursuit of criteria wasn't a misguided pursuit of a single ideal notation which would be the model for thought. Uh, the the, the terms of reference were imposed not from within philosophy, which in, in any case didn't exist as a separate subject then. The terms of reference arose from our shared human and social situation from the fact that we knew too much in one area, too little in another, that our picture of ourselves was getting dehumanized, that the areas in which we did know a lot, or do know a lot, and continue to know a lot, don't serve as very good premises for deciding, let us say, what kind of social political order we have. These are the, the, this, this is a concrete problem situation in reaction to which people are philosophized, namely try to state premises which will be persuasive so that they can re arrive at a consensus without using violence in so doing. Um, now, this is an objective situation. It has nothing to do with the famous bewitchment by language or the pursuit of an ideal notation. This, this I would say, is the crucial error in, in that particular philosophy. I've asked you to give your observations on a number of <clears throat> schools of contemporary philosophy, recent Anglo-Saxon philosophy culminating in uh, the later Wittgenstein, 
uh, existentialism, Marxism, relativism, uh, perhaps you think all of them have a lot of juice in them in the sense of being able to or likely to bear fruit in the future, but uh, which, if any, do you think? I don't think I would single out movements by name, mm. um, but I think both these, the, 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 both the mainstreams, the, on the one hand, the codification, the, the concentration on the process of knowledge and the, 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 the attempt to formulate criteria of knowledge, um, on the one hand, and the sustained investigation of our human social situation on the other are highly meritorious. And the, the way forward seems to me, well, seems to me in two, in, in, consists of a kind of confluence of these two um, at a more sophisticated level. Now, uh, the, 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 the point about the, the tradition which examines knowledge or thought or in later variant language, the point about this seems to me the following. It's basically kind of norm-setting exercise. It's, a, it's an exercise in trying to codify the criteria for valid claims to knowledge. It's a kind of attempt to establish, the, if you like, the, the entrenched clauses of the, of the constitution of the Republic of Knowledge. Now, this seems to me an admirable exercise which will benefit for be, from being seen as such. It's often in the past seen as a kind of descriptive account. Um, and the either descriptive or explanatory account of how knowledge, how individual knowledge actually works. And, and, and as such, it doesn't have all that much merit. I mean... In I've, other words, what you see it as is a sort of, you see modern philosophy more as an organon, as an instrument for actually acquiring knowledge, as uh, telling us how we should go about. If you like, this yes. is closer to that than, than the description. I mean, one of the, one of the elements of, one of the valid elements in the later philosophy of Wittgenstein, which I, which I otherwise repudiate, is of course the following, that, that he, he, what he stressed was something which people knew but didn't treat sufficiently seriously, that as an account of how language actually works, it of course is absurd. Language isn't a matter of matching sentences to, to sensations or little observations and then building up from this a picture in a kind of, in a kind of sandcastle, sandcastle way from little grains and then adding evaluation of the kind of flag stuck on top of the castle, the kind of and the, the account of the accumulation of knowledge from little descriptive sentences, and then adding add, adding evaluation and all the other things, the, the humanizing things separately. This is absurd. It doesn't work like that. It's the, our actual employment of, of language is obviously built into institutions and our customs and so on. And he was dead right on that. Um, so that as a as a demolition of a descriptive account of language, I think he was right. If if, if this needed to be doing, he was right on this. Similarly, I think the, 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 the importance of the work in linguistic of Chomsky is, is, a, is a, to, to my mind, a completely conclusive demonstration of the fact that as an explanatory account of how we acquire, well, in his case, linguistic skills, but it applies to cognitive skills, that this cannot be done in the... The, 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 the old theory of knowledge tradition was very poor on, 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 on offering a good, good model of this, and, the, and this science I'll accept. However, if one accepts these kind of negative demolition jobs in, 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 the, in the recent intellectual scene, it doesn't actually cause need, oblige one, or, or indeed, in my view, allow one to, to abandon the theory of knowledge as a kind of attempt to codify, to, to set the norms for cognitive enterprise. Now, this is one, this is one element where I, where I seem to see the uh, way forward. In conjunction with this, I think it has to be with a kind of much more realistic um, account of our social and historical situation. The distinctiveness of what is loosely called industrial society, that's a society based on growing effective control of nature, applied technology, universal literacy, and various other mass, mass organizations and so on. This, this, ironically enough, I'm saying philosophy has to be both more abstract and norm-setting on the one hand, and more sociological and concrete on the other, and I don't think there's a contradiction in making these two recommendations. I mean, Marxism was concrete and sociological, it just unfortunately got, 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 it, got it wrong. But um, I would prefer to see somebody, somebody else get it right, um, and instead to get it right without messianic expectations. This, this seems to me the way forward. The marriage of the, the rea realistic sense of the distinctiveness of industrial civilization, its preconditions and implications, combined with doing this normative job, often its norm-setting job, 
of, 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 of using the criteria of knowledge as the only basis for security that we can possibly have. Would you see a concern with language as being a unifying factor in, in contemporary philosophy? Because no. it does appear that wherever you look, even schools that differ from each other about a great many things have that in common, an enormous concern with language. I think there is an underlying unity. In, in, I mean, in, in, the, in your opening remarks, you said it's been one plot. Oh. Well, it, it has, more or less, but it, not, on the surface it hasn't quite often. Um, and on the whole, in the discussion, we agreed about what the underlying shared themes and preoccupation and plot were. Language, oddly enough, doesn't seem to me to be one of them. It looks like it on the surface, but I can think of three major movements in the century, which make a fuss about, three at least, which make a big fuss about language. And it seems to me the way in which they invoke language is so different that the similarity is entirely superficial. Now, the major, the, the really big contrast of Angus is, for instance, between the language preoccupation of someone like Wittgenstein and his followers in the English-speaking philosophic world, and somebody like Chomsky. They both make a fuss about language, but it's almost diametrically opposite. The point about the, 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 the main point about the late Wittgensteinian use of language was to use it as a kind of solution. Language was the resting place. The actual employment of language provided the only norms that we could have or did have or needed, needed to have. In other words, it was the kind of, the idea was that the pursuit of more general, extraneous validations or what, what, what the delusion, an actual linguistic custom was a kind of resting place. Now, the major, this seems to me the central idea of Chomsky, which makes him important, that he really brought home how problematic language was, namely that the, 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 the kind of skills which go into, into the construction and understanding of, 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 of um, sentences, which we take for granted, is something which mustn't be taken for granted. So their use of language is almost diametrically opposite. Um, for Chomsky discovered how very much it is the problem, Wittgenstein tried to use it to the solution. So that although both make a fuss about language, they seem to me, I could hardly think of two systems of thought which are more radically opposed to each other, um, whether, or not, whether or not their individual followers recognize this. And again, the, 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 um, of course, the, the, the contrast in the invocation of language between Wittgenstein and the earlier so-called logical positivist analytic movement is also very considerable. They as well, try to use the limits of language as a way of providing us with, 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 with um, bases for a, a re-establishment of a consensus, of a vision of the world. Whereas Wittgenstein used, used language as the premise for saying that we don't need such a basis, that we never need, there's no, 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 no need to look for it. So that lang language doesn't seem to me a unifying theme it's, it's the, 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 the idea of language has been used in such widely different ways that it doesn't, in fact, give a unity to 20th century thought. Do you think there's likely to continue to be a unity on some other basis in the philosophy of the immediate future? Well, I wouldn't... It's very, very tricky making predictions about what, 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 um, what people will do. Uh, all I know is what seems to me the, the correct thing to do, and the correct thing, as far as I can see, is the pursuit of the epistemological, the theory of knowledge tradition, the, the attempt to codify the criteria of what is sensible and what isn't, married to a much more concrete, hard-headed interest in the actual social reality. I mean, this is, this, this is, this is the particular style which seems to me to be fertile, um, and this is more, more a statement about what I like to see done than what I think people necessarily do. I mean, um, well, I hope that your pessimism on that latter point turns out to be uh, mistaken. Thank you very much, Professor Gilmer.